You're listening to the Co-Creator Network. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Good afternoon. Welcome to Why Shamanism Now, a practical path to authenticity with your host, Christina Pratt. Director of the Last Mask Center for Shamanic Healing. She's talking about how shamanic skills can bring us to physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual well-being, especially when nothing else can. Now, here's your host, Christina Pratt. Welcome, everyone, to Why Shamanism Now. I would like to call in the spirits to support us here today in this um, challenging uh, topic, challenging and exciting topic. So I'd like to call out to the ancestors, those who bring all that is good and true and beautiful into my life and into yours. I call out to all those who have gone before us to come be with us here today to teach us what they knew so well. They knew and understood deeply the power and necessity of initiation that all individuals be brought through the ritual process from childhood into adulthood and firmly uh, grounded there in their adult life. So we call out to all of the ancestors who understood this so very well, who experienced it themselves and who conducted it for others. And we ask them to gather around us here today that we might rediscover what was already known and bring this wisdom forward today in a way that is useful for contemporary people and for the descendants to come. We call out to the energy of the earth below that great and giving mother, the the true mother energy to be with us here today, to help us to feel the interconnectedness of all things, to feel our own grounding and our sense of belonging, not only to the line of our ancestors and to the people we are presently connected to, but to those descendants who are calling us to bring our gifts to the world. We call out to the energy of the earth and we give thanks for the wonder of her dreaming that brought life to this planet as we know it. And we give thanks for this miracle. And then we ask the earth to support each one of us in being grounded and connected to ourself that we might live this day as an expression of that miracle. And with our feet firmly planted in the earth and the ancestors gathered round, we reach up to the energy of the sky and we call down this true energy from above, bringing in the archetypal energy of the true father. We call this energy down, bringing the sky and the earth together within our circle here, within our bodies, within our day. And we bring these energies together so that the earth and sky might touch and know and ignite the big love. This energy has birthed all life as we know it into existence. And we give thanks to this energy, calling it down, calling in the bright and beautiful clarity of the energy above, calling in blessing. For each and every one of us, calling in generosity and the benevolence of this world, this universe that we are in, and finally calling in protection, that we might be held well in these proceedings here today. We call out to these energies to be with us, not only in our circle, but within each one of us. And may the energy of the earth and sky connect within you, that you might ignite the energy of your heart. And I call in the energy of the heart, that wonderful place that is the same in all realms. The heart is a very, very special place that has the capacity to handle the intensity and passion of the energies that rise up from our belly, that bring us to our soul's purpose with the refinement and the clarity and the illumination of the energies of the mind. The heart has the ability to bring these two energies together to craft for each one of us a sense of knowing and expression of our soul's true purpose. So with all of these energies called in here today, I give thanks to all of the help that we are receiving and ask that that which needs to be heard can be heard and that which needs to be said can be said and that our proceedings uh, today have meaning and purpose in the world. And may they be good for all living things. So we give thanks to the spirit energies for being with us. I give thanks to each of you for joining me here today or whatever day it is you're listening to this podcast. And I want to express my profound gratitude to the members of Last Mass community who continue to donate generously that this show is possible for all of us to experience, for me to offer, and for you all to receive. Um, If you would um, find the show valuable, you are welcome to donate now too. Um, I would like to introduce the new whyshamanismnow.com website for the show. Um, you can, uh, it's a new place for you to be able to access and download the shows, all of the shows archived all the way back to January of 2009. 
Um, and if you would like to donate to Why Shamanism Now, if you find this show or other shows valuable, please go to www.whyshamanismnow, uh, as one word, dot com, and click on the support button. And feel free to donate any amount, large or small. Um, truly, every single dollar helps. It keeps the show on the air and keeps the INE energy flowing. Um, so welcome everyone to today's show. Our topic is Curing Our Cultural Sickness. This is an initiation series. So why? Well, this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. I also believe that it is critically important. Um, After 20 years of practice, uh, one of the things that I do in my practice, usually with the people that are here, but often just on my own so that I can understand better what it is that I'm doing, I ask to be shown what is the true source of a problem. A person might not yet be ready to deal with the true source of a problem, but I feel as the practitioner that I need to understand that. Um, And I share that, of course, if the person is interested. And more and more and more as I practice now, the true source of the problem comes back, winding through different manifestations in present time, back to the fact that we as contemporary people are not initiated from childhood to adulthood. And so the value then of looking at shamans and their initiations is it provides a metaphor for us for understanding what a true and meaningful initiation is. In other words, initiation is an archetypal function that is meant to function in the lives of humans. It is an essence energy we should be tending. Um, And so my thought here is that by introducing this topic of initiation, which we have touched on in many other shows, frankly, but to to talk about initiation here from the perspective of it at at the source of much of our our cultural sickness, Um, and then to bring in array an array a diverse range of shamanic practitioners male and female some from the u.s some from the uk um, bringing these practitioners in to talk to us about initiation how it how they experienced it in their own life as contemporary practitioners how they may or may not be um, guiding others in it as as their own students um, and just talk about this and then perhaps listening to a diverse group of people discussing this, we can begin to draw some parallels and begin maybe to have an answer to the questions I will pose at the end of this show, which ultimately is, given that we live now in a broken system, what do we do? Where do, where do we begin? How do we begin to fix what is broken? Um, but we're not at the end of the show yet. We're at the beginning of the show. So, what we're going to do is over the next several weeks is, again, to look at the, the initiation of a shaman as a metaphor for the initiation of a human. And specifically what we're interested in, because it is universally valuable, is the initiation from childhood to adulthood. Much of the shamanic ritual activity in pre-contact shamanic people, this would be shamanic people prior to the introduction of Western thought, um, or actually Eastern thought, but basically um, shamanic people left to their own devices. So much of the shamanic ritual of pre-contact shamanic people has to do with tending the essence of this life process called initiation. And what I mean by a life process is what I've been taught by my helping spirits is that human beings are here first and foremost to live their soul's purpose. Okay, but in the process of doing that, in the process of becoming the person who can do that, in that creative process of discovery, there are archetypal life experiences that we as humans go through. And we are always in at least one life process. So we go through death, rebirth, the process of faith, the process of trust, the process of facing our fears, the process of discernment. The process of learning to simply just do what it takes to get it done, whatever it is. That's a piece from the warriorship. There's a piece from the visionary aspect, which is a life process around truth-telling. These life processes all are happening to us all the time. However, if we are not adults, if we don't encounter this life process from an adult perspective, we frankly think life is hard and then we die. You know, that's where these 
contemporary cultural sayings come from if we approach these life processes as children living in adult bodies who haven't been initiated into adulthood, they're impossible to deal with. And they challenge us in such a way that we feel put upon, we feel victimized by our life. We don't have a way to engage with these life processes. And so what I'm saying, my, my hypothesis here is that shamanic peoples, pre-contact shamanic peoples understood how critically important this particular life process called initiation is for everything else to work. Because without initiation, the way people behave, the flow of the natural energy that moves between people and people in their environment and people in their environment in the spirit world, all, all those relationships, the natural energy that flows in those relationships and binds a people as a community is stopped and the community begins to fall apart when people are not initiated. When the people move from childhood to adulthood and are not initiated, another thing that happens is those individuals who continue to approach life from the perspective of their childhood, even though they are now adults, are truly challenged in being able to find their soul's purpose and live a life of meaning and value to them. And as we discussed in a prior show, this leads to a whole host of physical, emotional, and mental illness. To not know our purpose here and live a life of meaning um, leads to a huge, um, vast amount of what, what ails us as contemporary people. And furthermore, what these shamanic people understood is that without initiation, the dead... So the spirits of the dead get stuck here and they don't, the presence then of the dead even further challenges the health of the living. And then it also leaves that ever essential role of the ancestors as helping spirits. It leaves that role vacant because the dead person is stuck here and not able to translate into that ancestral helping spirit energy. So then what happens is the living can't help but make the same mistakes again and again that, that their predecessors made. That the, the role of the ancestors as helping spirits is to help us to learn from the past. It's the ancestors' job to remember. It's our job to learn from those memories and to create, to heal, to create, to forgive, to go forward and to do it differently. And so without any ancestral help, I actually just did a session with a man who, because of his life circumstances, was utterly disconnected from his ancestral helping spirits as well as his own personal helping spirits in terms of animals and other compassionate beings. Um, and this man's life was so incredibly hard. And it was hard for reasons that made no sense. That's That's what happens to us when we are stripped of our spirit help is life becomes incredibly challenging and challenging in ways that don't even make any sense. They don't even have any meaning. And so once again, we get into that predicament that has come up many times in many topics on this show is getting into a situation we are, where, where we are suffering and that suffering has no meaning. We're not learning from it. There is nothing to be learned from it. And so my hypothesis here is, is that initiation as a life process is critical and that we as a culture must rediscover this and tend this essence energy, tend this life process in our world. Because what's happening today is that this initiation is being, being diminished psychologically, being, being um, diminished to this psychological idea that it is simply... Um, Oh, now I'm spacing out on the word. The um, individuation from the parents. Now, in a traditional shamanic initiation, it does involve it into individuation from the parents psychologically. But actual initiation functions physically, emotionally, and spiritually as well as psychologically. So the diminishment that's happening right now through a, psycholog a purely psychological interpretation of initiation is leading us astray. Similarly, 
the new age perspective is leading us astray because from the new age, you get statements like life initiates everyone. So every challenge or hardship anyone meets is named, is labeled initiation and that um, the healing from any sickness makes you a wounded healer. You know, that, that this, this um, simplistic oversimplification that every single thing that in life that isn't perfectly rosy is somehow has this great meaning. And what I'm talking about is looking at initiation as a life process that serves functions, not just psychologically in terms of individuation from the parents, but spiritually and emotionally and physically. And if these functions don't all happen, then it's not an initiation. And so that's um, what we need to understand about initiation. And I don't feel that I'm oversimplifying uh, the problems of our contemporary culture, because when we look at shamanic cultures, we see that this, this one thing to, to make sure that every individual received initi- meaningful initiation from childhood to adulthood um, was an activity that, that um, people spent a great amount of resources of time and energy making sure that they happened. And so what I'm saying is here we are in a contemporary culture where the more I journey about why we're experiencing what we're experiencing, the more lack of initiation shows up at the source. And then at the same time, we see these indigenous, these shamanic people who spent an enormous amount of time, energy, and resources in making sure it happened. To me, these two things are the same message, which is that we as contemporary people need to look at this because if we could perhaps solve this one thing, we could actually bring a great deal of healing to our just contemporary cultural sicknesses. So that's what we're exploring here today and for the next several weeks, actually. Um, and I, I hope that the shows with these um, guests will be really fascinating because they're very different people, very, very different shamanic lineages, um, very, very different life experiences. So the thing... I, I want to be uh, careful about here is while I am saying, I, I am saying that our contemporary American culture, and I think most Western cultures are failing completely in this regard to initiate our children into adults. Um, it, it is not my intent to offend those who still have religious based initiations. At the same time, we need to understand that these religious religiously oriented initiations are not life-threatening. They are symbolic initiations within the religion, and they are fine. I'm not criticizing them in any way. But what I am saying is that they are not functioning in the, in, uh, as the type of initiation that I'm talking about. So in other words, I'm not saying these religions shouldn't be doing what they're doing. It's lovely. They should be doing what they're doing. It's fine. It's not my point to – not my right to say one thing or the other. What I am saying, though, is that these initiations do not serve the function, the archetypal function of initiation that I'm speaking about today. If they did, those religious communities would be filled with truly mature spiritual adults making significantly better quality decisions than the rest of us. And I don't see that happening. They're not any worse than we are, certainly, but statistically – they rank right in there with the rest of us with all the same dysfunctions, et cetera, as any other contemporary person. So what? So I'm just saying the proof is in the pudding. We're not seeing an entire culture being born from these initiations of, of these significantly mature spiritual adults that are making much higher quality decisions because if we were, they'd be leading our culture right now, and they're not. They're just as screwed up as the rest of us. Um, not anymore. But they're certainly not doing any better. So what, what's important then is we understand that initiation as an essence energy needs to be attended so that it stays firm in its true function. So in other words, we can't diminish it psychologically. We can't completely wash it out by calling everything an initiation like the New Age movement is doing. That what happens in this initiatory life process is that because the initiate experiences what feels like 
an actual death. Some would describe it feeling more like a physical death. Others would experience it as really feeling the internal death of the internal sense of self. Um, But either way, the person feels so challenged by the initiatory experience that they die. That the person that they are, the child, the child who has entered into the initiatory process faced by that initiation, dies. It has to let go of everything it still believes it deserves, its mommy and its daddy, and all that list of debts we believe we deserve because we, our needs weren't met 100% every day of our life as a child. And that that child self dies. And out of the ashes of that death, the adult who wants to live because the soul's purpose is still burning. Because the truth of the matter is children don't care about soul's purposes, right? That the soul cares about the soul's purpose. Children are just trying to survive. So what happens is the soul who wants to live its purpose rises out of the ashes of that childhood death and reaches out for Okay, so now we've had a physical death, we've had an emotional death, and a psychological death. So we've had already the individuation from the parents now because the child dies. And this individual soul, so individuated from the parents, reaches out of the ashes of the child death. And now this is the important spiritual piece of the initiation, is they reach out into the invisible world and they reach to whatever is embodies for them in their understanding of reality as the archetypal mother and father. And so they are bringing their soul into relationship with the archetypal energy. So it's the sky as the archetypal father and the sun, I mean, and the earth as the archetypal mother or whatever. But the point is the individual soul is no longer attached to humans who are by definition flawed. We are here as humans because we're working on something. So we have something going on. And so that child lets go of the flawed parents. They're all human. They're all fine. I'm not judging them. It's just the fact. If we're here, we've got a flaw we're working on. Let's the child die and reaches out as an adult and latches on to the spirit world as the true source of support in life, as the mentor, as the champion, as the healing energy from the mother and father, the teaching energy from the mother and father, the warriorship, the, the, everything that the child looks for in the parents, the, uh, the, uh, the soul who has a soul's purpose to live in its, in the desperation of the child's death, that soul reaches out to the spirit world, to the true archetypal energies of mother and father, of the divine, of the earth as the home that the soul has come to make this soul's purpose manifest, and it connects to the real energies. That's what needs to happen for initiation to be, to function. And this is why some of the, there are a few organizations that do, for contemporary times, reasonable initiatory processes for kids by bringing them out into nature and teaching them to survive and connect with nature. And and in that, they are helping these children to reach out to something bigger than humanity and bigger than their parents to support them. And so in this initiation, that soul reaches out to the spirit world, and in that connection, there is an accepting of the adult responsibilities for maintaining your side of the relationship with these invisible forces. These invisible forces, these compassionate beings, these archetypal energies are present to assist you. And they will come to you as they are asked, child or adult, frankly. But as an adult, you are responsible for maintaining good relationship with these energies, for for allowing yourself to be motivated by your heart So you're not approaching these relationships with the invisible world from a greedy, um, capitalistic, um, linear, 
I want to get all that I can for nothing attitude, but you're understanding I am in this for life. I am going to spend my whole life living this soul's purpose. I've decided to be here as a human and to do this then as a human, I need to stay in right relationship with these energies because I will be calling on them day after day after day. And so this is what's happening in the initiation that the person is letting go of the child life and the child orientation with mom and dad and humanity and extending out to the larger invisible world for the support in that coming to accept the adult responsibility for maintaining good relationship with these invisible energies and then returning from the initiatory experience, which is an altered state experience returning from that initiatory experience allowing the person that they were, the child that they were, to be dead. There is a letting go and a surrender of that self. And a stepping forward into the unknown of, I don't, the the experience being, I don't have any idea who I am right now. All I know is I'm not the person I was before. My soul's purpose is burning within me to be lived. And I am now connected to a whole array of unseen forces that will support me in this life. And I commit myself now to the unknown. Um, and, and I let go of that story I had running as a child about how reality works. I let go of that. And I open to discovering how the real energies work in the world because I am connected to these essence energies and to these deeper real energies. So this is the function of an initiation from childhood to adulthood. And then, okay, we're not done yet. The full function then of the individual come out of the altered state and enter back into ordinary reality. You are aware you are an entirely different person. The old story about how everything worked is no longer valid. You're connected into your cosmology and the possibility of how things could work. You're here for one reason, and that is living your soul's purpose. And you're grounding all of that new reality in ordinary reality, in the everyday, breathe air, stand on the earth, waking time. Then the initiates that make that journey, the initiates that come to that place of return from the initiatory experience. These initiates are then brought back to the circle of adults in the community, not the children, but the adults in the community and are honored and recognized and allowed formally to take their place in the circle of adults. In some cultures, you would even get a new name at that point. To, to You would give up your childhood name and take on maybe your true spirit name or at least an adult name that would acknowledge this transformation. And the important thing about this, because as you think about it for the contemporary world, the important thing about this is that this brand spanking new adult gets brought into a community of adults where they can receive mentoring and modeling of what it means to be an adult. And so the physical, emotional, psychological, and spiritual expectations of adulthood are not only clear, but they are modeled by the other adults in the circle. And in this way, the new initiate is no longer uh, left to just invent things on their own. But they're able now to see this is how this operates. And then in this way, these adults who have an understanding of, of standards, essentially, in how to operate physically, emotionally, mentally, and psychologically, maintain those standards. And those standards are really sort of, I don't know, the simplest way to say it would be the minimum consciousness in terms of waking up and the minimum growing up consciousness necessary for community to function. Whether that community is a family living in a family house in those shamanic cultures where um, 
People don't live in a village. They actually live in extended family houses um, to those communities that all live in one great big house or one great big village, that there's a certain minimum behavior expected. For example, um, among many of the Amazonian shamans, that if you are an adult, you there is a clear understanding that um, – Around, if in the physical world, for example, an example would be you are welcome to participate in sex play, as we would derogatorily call it, but basically sexual activity with any other consenting adult. Um, however, the there is a very fine, uh, finite, definite line between sexual activity and intercourse. An intercourse between between a man and a woman that would ultimately potentially result in childhood is absolutely forbidden. And so that's a very clear expectation. As an adult, you're welcome to enjoy sexual activity now, and your and intercourse is strongly regulated in this culture because in that culture, a man is not allowed to father a child until he has shown his capacity as a man in that culture to hunt and to take the life of another, to be the warrior necessary to support that child, to support and protect that child. It's very, very regulated. Now, this is a ex- fairly extreme example, but I just wanted to show you an example of um, clearly defined um, parameters around what it means to be an adult. Um, so that's really the initiation process that we're looking at, the function of Uh, The ego death, which is how we would talk about it psychologically, but it truly is, the important thing thing is, it is the death of the child story, the story of the wounded child. So what happens without initiation? Why am I making such a big deal out of this? Why am I dragging you through weeks of stories about initiation? Okay, let's just talk through that. Without initiation... We remain a child in our view of life regardless of our age. In other words, our preconceived ideas from our childhood experience, like if I behave this way, then this happens. If I'm a good girl, then this happens. If I'm a bad boy, then this happens. That These ideas we gain from childhood about how we learn to survive in our family, in our church, or in our religion, whatever that might be, or the lack of it in our um, school system, if we have one, in our cultural system, whatever that might be. Some people live in neighborhoods where the neighborhood itself has its own culture. And that ultimately we are all also learning from the time that we are born in. There are time spirits that are teaching us. And so all of these things are affecting us as children who are just trying to figure out how to survive to get to adulthood. Okay. The The challenge with this is that the story that the child creates is based on the past and based on a whole set of fears about what will or won't happen if we do or don't behave certain ways. And so everything is seen through the lens of that child's story or seen through the lens of the past. And we didn't get all of our needs met. That's part of the fact of childhood. Some severely didn't get their needs met. Some beyond getting their needs met were horribly abused. And so this is, these are the stories, the child stories that we carry forward. There's nothing wrong with doing that. It's only natural, but that's why initiation is so important. Okay. So what happens then as we age into an adult body and are no longer a child. So now we're being given adult responsibilities and having to make adult choices in life is that the, the child, the internal child um, psychology, the internal child self projects their parents, their unresolved issues with their parents or their life as a child. It could be their hometown or their culture, their religious upbringing, whatever it is. They project their unresolved issues with these authority figures in their life onto the world onto every group that they're part of, onto every experience. And through that projection, if they're unconscious of it, and most people are, then then they begin to blame and shame everyone out there for continuing to not meet the child's needs. Because, of course, that's the story, is that the child's needs didn't get met. So this is then truly unsatisfying for everyone. 
of course, because the person who is acting from the internal child out, but unaware of it, gets really angry for being treated like a child. Um, the person who's expecting adult behavior out of the person who's actually acting motivated from that internal child is constantly disappointed. And through this dynamic of inner children, um, inner wounded children um, acting out through adult bodies, we end up in the marvelous dance of codependent relationships. And people become codependent and addictive about their relationships with everything, with work, with um, their partners, with their friends, anything. So the person's life then gets caught up in this dance of frustration of being challenged by life with the constant need to make adult choices, but without the internal ability to make good quality adult choices. Um, And we, and, and the challenge with this is of course, we're meant to be paying attention to other things like your soul's purpose, like the creation of a life, like effectively attending to the problems of our time with good quality decisions that will make the world a better place for the next seven generations. I mean, we're meant to be doing other things. And yet, as long as this wounded child story is running the show, as long as we are uninitiated, no matter how much we attempt to grow up until that initiation actually occurs, our lives get sucked into this drama again and again and again. And the culture, our culture currently has shaped around this and is beginning to call this the human condition and assuming humans have always been this way. This is just what humans do. And we've created entire industries around normalizing this condition, therapy, pharmaceuticals, divorce lawyers. I mean, there's whole industries of people that get paid a whole lot more money than I do that are involved in normalizing the condition of children living in adult bodies, acting out codependent relationships with everything in their life. So our lives are caught up in this drama and nobody is noticing that they are not actually tracking reality. And that is the whole point of what shamanic people understood. If you live your adult life from the point of view of your unresolved childhood, you are not living in reality. By definition, the way in which you see every day is being distorted by the lens of the past. This isn't the human condition. This is the contemporary illness. When cultures initiated their young, they did so because they understood the damage done to individuals and communities by the uninitiated adult. Pre-contact shamanic cultures were extremely sophisticated spiritually and psychologically and emotionally. They did what they did not out of fear, but out of understanding the damage done by a human who is a profoundly powerful manifestation machine, if that machine is being driven by a child who can't see over the dashboard and can barely reach the pedals. So is this the human condition? I say no. I say this is a contemporary cultural sickness that results from not tending to the human archetypal need for life redefining initiation from childhood to adulthood. I cannot tell you the number of teenage kids I have rescued from soul loss. In other words, the soul part at the teenage, okay, backing up. I cannot tell you how many adults come to me as clients and the problem they're faced with in their life is that they lost a part of themselves as teenagers because that self knew the need for initiation. We know the need for these archetypal life processes. We understand this in our soul. So this adult person has, in their teenage years, felt the need for initiation and looked around and saw no adults in their life. Everyone in their life is acting more childish than the next. There are no adults in their life, and there is no initiation coming. And that soul that wants so badly to to drop the shell of the child and all of that drama and express the soul's purpose sees no help on the horizon and just collapses under the weight of a culture that has forgotten its responsibility to its individuals to initiate the young. I cannot tell you how many 14, 15, 16 year old boys I've drug off the couch, stoned out of their gourds, um, playing video games utterly immersed in another world 
because the initiation they need that's going to make them a man is not coming. I cannot tell you how many teenage girls I have drugged back from the female equivalent of this, just checked out and angry because what they need is not here in the culture. And these soul retrievals help those individual people. But when are we going to stop the madness? You know, when are we going to stop as a culture and recognize what we are doing or frankly not doing isn't working? And that until we step up culturally to our responsibility to initiate people, it isn't going to work. So a beautiful example of this is in a book by Maladoma Somme. And it's a book he wrote actually quite a while ago, right, while ago called Of Water and the Spirit, Ritual, Magic, and Initiation in the Life of an African Shaman. And um, again, we suggest that you purchase this book at your local small bookshop or through www.powells.com online. Uh, as you Google Somme, you will also find Sabonfu Somme. And her books are also wonderful teachers. So Maladoma's and Sobonfu's books are wonderful, wonderful teachers. In this one book, though, what Maladoma is talking about is very autobiographical. And it's talking about his story. And the simple version is at six years old, he gets taken by the Jesuits to a um, Jesuit monastery and school and gets raised by the Jesuits to, to be a um, Jesuit priest, ultimately. Um, and he is educated in a Western system. European system, actually. And at, um, at, in his late teens, uh, he, he escapes. He, I don't know if it, how drastic an escape it was, but basically he leaves and he wasn't supposed to. And he literally walks across a large part of Africa to find his village. And he is guided by spirit to find his village. Because the truth is, he doesn't really know where he is on the map relative to where his village was because he got taken from his village when he was six. So he is welcomed home. Everyone is so excited to see Maladoma returning to the village. And everybody is delighted that he's back. He's delighted to be back. All is good until, except, except for the fact that though he is educated, he is not initiated. And his absolutely normal, everyday, ordinary Western behavior is destroying the community of the village. And finally, the village elders come to him and say, Maladoma, our son, we love you and we are so happy that you are back. But unless you are willing to go through the traditional initiation for young men, which of course now he's about five years too old to do, right? Unless you are willing to go through the initiation of the young men, we must ask you to leave. And it breaks their hearts to do this. But they must because his behavior, though normal, it would appear normal in our eyes, is so damaging and frankly violent. Although, of course, he's not acting in any way that is outwardly violent. So what's going on here? Well, for me, with my students at this point in this story, this conversation, this, this need to understand the importance of initiation and what truly is initiation... I go to a piece uh, in Pema Chodron's work from um, When Things Fall Apart. And what she is saying is that the original act of violence, the original act from which all other violence eventually stems, is this subtle act inside the person of being unwilling to look at themselves. And that that is the origin of all violence, is that subtle act within the person. It's an act of violence against the true self to be unwilling to look at the self. So in other words, to put this into context, if I am an adult, an uninitiated adult, I am acting out of my old childhood stories. And life is responding to me basically saying these two things don't match up. You are not a child. What, you, what the child thinks is going on is not what's going on. You are an adult. You need to see things from an adult perspective. And so what's happening is dissonance in my life. What Payment Children is talking about is noticing those stones you trip over, noticing the dissonance in your life, noticing your life, showing to you where what you think is going on is not tracking with what is going on and noticing. In other words, waking up out of your denial and then being willing to look in to yourself. So, 
So it's that refusal to look, to notice and look that is the original act of violence. And I agree with her in this and, you know, big, huge world religion backing her up on that. And I would say that the second act of violence then comes after the first, because when a human refuses to look at themselves accurately and honestly and compassionately, then the next thing they do is to project that unlooked at self out onto the world. So the story that's going on inside gets projected out onto the world. And that is the second act of violence. Because as soon as I project my story out on the world, I am no longer seeing the world. How do you feel when someone is talking at you and doesn't see you? How do you feel when your lover, your most intimate person in your life, doesn't see you, doesn't get you? How did you feel as a child when you weren't seen? We understand the damage of not being seen. What we need to understand is that every moment we project our unresolved reality out onto the world, we are not seeing anyone or anything. And this is the second act of violence, to not see others accurately, to project instead of see and respond. So then what happens, and we all know this because we have all done it, is that projection, you get a little energy behind that because you're sure that you're right and it's reality and your position is, of course, correct. And you begin now to shame and blame and to hold others accountable for your version of reality. And they have no idea what's going on because the truth is they're not living in your version of reality. Only you are. And truly only you are because you're not that child anymore. You're not living it in real time. You're now projecting it onto real time, missing real time entirely and living out of the old story. So that becomes actual actions that are psychologically and emotionally and spiritually violent towards each other, if not evolving into physical violence in the dysfunction of our relationship. So if this is all news for you, then please understand you are doing this in your life. I know that it is not intentional, so please hold yourself in compassion and forgiveness. But this is where denial comes from. This is what Maladoma's elders were speaking about as they tried to explain the effect of Maladoma's normal Western-bred actions, though uninitiated, on the indigenous community Maladoma was from. Community needs healthy adult energies for it to work. And then the adults protect and manage the children within the community. But community needs healthy adults. And for adults to be healthy, we need community to initiate them. So where do we start with what is obviously a broken system? And this is a huge question. And instead of trying to answer that today, what I'm going to do is bring people onto the show who can talk about initiation from their own experience because the blind cannot lead the blind. You cannot become initiated by someone who is not initiated themselves. It doesn't work. You cannot lead where you have not followed. So where do we start to mend this broken system is a huge question. Um, A large factor in the success of of pre- contact initiations was that there was a community of spiritual adults for the new initiate to enter into. So what are we going to do with these new initiates if we could even create them when what is necessary physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually is not defined or even being modeled anywhere around us? So I ask you to think, review your life. Who was the last spiritual adult you spent time with? Think about it. Who was the last true spiritual adult you spent time with? Spiritual teachers who have sex with their students are not spiritual adults. Leaders who do not practice what they preach are not spiritual adults. Spiritual beliefs that support life in all forms and all of its diversity are the beliefs of spiritual adults. It is not, you are not a spiritual adult if your spiritual belief system only supports the life of those that are like you in your temple or congregation. 
So there are leaders, there are teachers, there are spiritual leaders all around us who are not spiritual adults. So think about it. Who was the last spiritual adult you spent time with? Have you ever even met one in your life? So, as the hour comes to a close here, I want to shift gears a little bit because what we've talked about, just to kind of review here, so what we've talked about is how important initiation is for the individual to be able to become adult who can deal with adult challenges in adult way, tracking with reality and living their soul's purpose, bringing those gifts to the world. Initiation is, incredi- is critical for fun- healthy functioning communities because it, because it is the only way that we can get adults to function in ways other than through codependent relationships. And communities cannot function in a healthy way when they function through codependent patterns. And that is how we function until we have transformed those patterns and ultimately become initiated adults. And then the final piece I want to bring in here uh, through shamanism is the piece about death. Because the fact of the lack of initiation follows you into death. And this is one of the biggest health crises we're dealing with right now from a shamanic perspective. So um, a listener, thankfully, um, shared with me a piece that I had forgotten about from Martin Prechtel's book, Honey in the Heart. All of these books, Maladomas, Martins, Pema Children's, they're all out there for you to read and look into yourself. Um, and Martine Prechtel's book um, is speaking about um, it coming from the basis of Mayan shamanism, for those of you who don't know. And this is a quote from Honey in the Heart. When uninitiated people grow old and die, only their body actually melted back into the earth. The soul, however, for not having been cooked by its dealings with death in initiations as a young person, would not be solid enough or have the right shape to be able to enter the next world. In such cases, it hung around its relations like a hungry dog. The soul of such a person was so dependent and needing needing of taking care of that this bodiless soul becomes a ghost. And these kinds of ghosts could eat generations of descendants, turning them into greedy mongers, addicts, drunks, backstabbers, sociopaths, or bullies, all unwilling to grow up, suckling on the lives of its descendants like a large, invisible, demonic baby. Such a soul... Uh, would add on to itself the souls of each life destroyed until, after generations of sucking the life out of its people, it would become a monster five souls wide or worse. This is a beautiful paragraph. Scary, granted, but beautiful. I've never been quite so courageous in describing the drama, true drama, of what I see working with my clients. I see this all the time. I call it the unresolved energy of the ancestors. And I've talked about it with people in terms of their ancestors not living their lives in such a way that they are done. They've lived their soul's purpose and they can die in a good way and leave. And this is what I mean when I say I've spent the time journeying to ask, so what is the source of this? Why do we have so many ancestors unresolved stuck here in the realm of the living so that we are repeating their patterns again and again and again? The same wars, the same addictions, the same abuse. It just goes on and on and on down through the generations. Why? Well, here it is. And this is what I've found in my own asking of spirits. Why is this happening? It's because these people were uninitiated themselves. And they were unable to attend to life as an adult. To learn to meet their own needs. To learn to work together with others. To create a healthy life. To live a healthy life and create a healthy life for others. They they never were able to do that. And consequently, their life is unresolved, their soul's purpose is unlived, their death is messy, and they don't go anywhere. And then this is the second piece of this, which is the shamanic piece that I talk about with the ancestors. 
On the other side of the initiation of the young, shamanic people would make sure the dead, if they were these kind of uninitiated dead people, they would attend to that at their death. You can't force someone into anything while they are living because they are beings of free will as well. But once they're dead, the living who have free will can do whatever is necessary to clear the path and cross that soul over so that it does not hang around as one of these hungry dogs or one of these bodiless soul ghosts that is eating generations of generations by in essentially desperately trying to get their needs met through the life of the next generation and the next and the next and the next. And so much of the pre-contact shamanic world was involved at the front end trying to avoid all of these problems by simply initiating the young into adulthood. And then at the back end, once someone was dead, even if all their earlier efforts did not succeed and the person wasn't initiated and lived their life as they lived their life, at death, they would do their best to make sure they could cross that soul over. So here we are. In our contemporary world, a wash in a sea of uninitiated adults making poor choices, repeating the bad choices of their unresolved ancestors, and unable to see what's really going on because they're projecting their realities all around them. So what are we to do? First, I would like each one of you, if you are willing, to consider What do you need to do in your life? Where are you in this process? And do you need to engage in the kind of spiritual process that will allow you the path to initiation, no matter your age, because they are out there. The next question we need to ask is what do we need to do culturally? How, where do we begin to mend a broken system? How are we going to be able, how, what do we need to do to be able to support meaningful initiation in our lives? These are the questions we're going to ask over the next several weeks as we talk with different guests and consider these and perhaps come up with some answers after a few weeks. I'd like to acknowledge before we close here today, those organizations who are creating something for contemporary children, using nature as the teacher that does function as an actual initiation for these kids. It is way better than nothing. And I would like also to honor and acknowledge all of you who have experienced the terrifying experience of initiation outside of a cultural context and succeeded in completing that process yourself without community to welcome you home. And to all of you, I say, we have work to do. So thank you all for joining me this week. I hope that you will enjoy the guests that are coming over the next four or five weeks. Next week, our guest will be Desiree DeMars, who is one of the co-founders of the Center for Shamanic Healing in the San Francisco Bay Area. And she has had a very interesting life. And many, and her initiation played out in many stages. And so we will um, get to listen to her sharing her story next week. Um, over the weeks that follow, there will be other guests, male and female, from a variety of shamanic um, practices. So I'd like to thank them for joining us. I want to thank you for joining us. And I want to thank the spirits for being with us here today, for all of those ancestors who supported what needed to be heard coming out here today. I give thanks to the earth below and the sky above and the big love that comes to us from these two in that amazing love affair of earth and sky that brings life to this planet. I hope you all go out today and enjoy the miracle of that life in a good way. And finally, I want to give thanks to the heart that unites us all. For those of you that didn't uh, remember from the beginning, there is a new website, whyshamanismnow.com, where you can find the shows. You're also welcome to continue to download them through iTunes or from the co-creator website. Um, if you'd like a weekly reminder about the show, feel free to let me know at christina at lastmaskcenter.org. You can also find out anything you want to know about classes or healings with me, the Encyclopedia of Shamanism, all that sort of stuff at um, lastmasscenter.org at our website. And please feel free to share the information about this show. 
um, share the Facebook page and help us to grow the audience of the show. Thank you all for joining me this week.